are loved. I especially want you to know that this day, especially as we open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, known as the love chapter. It's the love chapter in the Bible. So today we're going to be talking about love. We, uh, we certainly know that we talk a lot about love, don't we? Love is an extremely uh, popular subject. Uh, I mean, how many books have been written about love? How many plays? How many cards have been given? How many times have you written the word love? I mean, for sure, how many Hallmark movies can they possibly make about love? I think, I think everybody's looking for love. It wasn't too many years ago that there was a psychological survey, and it was sent out to a myriad of people within the United States, but from different socioeconomic positions, uh, different ages, and it was a number of questions, but really there was an underlying question that they were looking to be answered from everybody. And that question is, what is it that you most want out of life? So they asked a whole lot of questions, trying to sift people down to what it is that people in the United States want most out of life. I really think it's in the world. And once all of the analytics were done and all of the researchers were finished and they were absolutely amazed with what they found. I think that they were thinking along the lines of material things, but once everything was sifted, it really came down to being at the top of the list of what people want is love, both to love and to be loved. Isn't that interesting? So now comes the billion dollar question for us. It used to be the million dollar question, but I have adjusted it for inflation. <laughs> so the billion dollar question is, what is love? What is it really? And how do you personally define love? How do you recognize love? Those are good questions for us. And as I look around the world, I see a great amount of confusion. I would call it increasing confusion between love and desire and selfishness and lust. Maybe we don't know the real answer. Or then again, maybe we do. Now, it's interesting that in the Greek language, which is a much bigger language than the English language, in the Greek language, they have several different words for love. And uh, let me give you an example. They use the word eros when they are speaking mainly of physical passion. Then there is philia, which is brotherly type love. Then there's storge love, which is parental love for your children. And then there is agape. Now, I bet you you know that's the one we're going to talk about today the highest form of love. It's unconditional love. It is love that God has for us and the love that we are to have for him. It speaks about sacrificial love. And this chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, is all about agape love. That's the word that's used in the Greek here. I wish these words were common in our own language, don't you? then we would know what kind of love we're talking about when we say love. Uh, I think we need to be wise and we need to be more careful, I believe, when we use the word love and not just throw it around the way that we do. Uh, we write about love, we think about love, we talk about love, we sing about love in every conceivable context, thank you, from weather to weddings from love for our pets to love for our favorite sports team. Let me give you a for instance of that. I think you all know that I love a double-double hamburger yeah. from In-N-Out. <laughs> and I know you love them too. <laughs> uh, but I also love my wife. And just to make the record clear, 
I love my wife far more than I love Double Double Hamburgers, just to make that clear. As I was studying this chapter once again, and I've studied it a number of times, I had the thought, I am so glad that the Church of Corinth were regular folk that made regular mistakes and needed an explanation of what love is. Because they needed an explanation of what love is, we get to benefit from Paul the Apostle writing to them and explaining to them all about what love is. Let's hear the whole chapter together, shall we? Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, Paul writes, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. That word puffed up could also be substituted with the word arrogant. It does not believe rudely, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. Father, we're staggered at your defining for us what love is. I pray, Lord, that your word would be found to be powerful in changing us from the inside to being more like Jesus, more loving. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would minister to each one of us individually in the place where we're at And you would, Holy Spirit, surround us today with your love. For we pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Everyone says, amen. Um, This is beautifully written, wouldn't you agree? I mean, this is poetry at the highest level. But we wouldn't want to stop at just considering it poetry. If we stopped there, we would be missing the true depth of it. This chapter is not an ode to love. Although I think I've seen this on pillows and on gifts and on cards. It's far more, I look at this chapter as far more like an invitation. This chapter is God sending you a special invitation for a hands-on, boots-on, daily marching forward into a real-life expression of our love for Jesus and our love for each other. Further, 
There's no need at all for any of us who know the Lord to grope in the darkness about what love is. It's very clear. It is defined, defined perfectly for us. I believe it was J. Vernon McGee who said, this chapter is the fuel of Christianity. So let's tank up today, shall we? With the love of God. Love is the great theme of all the Bible. You see, even before the world began, God was thinking about you and he was thinking about me. And there in the counsel of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God made the choice and the decision that his love for you would draw you into relationship with him and that you would be with him for all eternity. That's pretty exciting. Jesus even said that his followers would be recognized by their, by their love. Here's what we learn in Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 36. Jesus was asked, Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So it's no wonder that Jesus would say that his followers would be known by their love. In the last chapter, we were dealing with spiritual gifts, right? Gifts of the Holy Spirit. And in the next chapter, we'll be dealing with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But it seems to me that after Paul began that discussion on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, he stopped midway and he thought, you know what, before we continue with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I think it's very important that this church understand God's love. So it's a necessity then that we make clear the love of God. And as he begins to speak, he talks about Speaking, he talks about verbally. Look at verse one. Though I speak, and look, Paul is doing this in the first person. So he's talking about himself. He's not trying to point fingers at anybody, but I think that there are things that the Holy Spirit wants us to learn personally, just as Paul the Apostle learned personally. But he says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. He is referring here to speaking in various languages, earthly languages or heavenly languages. It is a gifting of God to some, not all, of a specific prayer language. However, I believe that there is a question being put forth in this statement by the Apostle Paul. And the question is, who or what am I as a believer? What am I as a believer? Am I speaking out of the love of God? Or am I just a clanging brass cymbal? That'd be pretty annoying, wouldn't it? Be pretty annoying. I wonder if, if somebody was so full of pride that they got a spiritual gift and they had to boast about it, I think that that would sound to God like just a clanging of a cymbal. It wouldn't mean anything. It wouldn't have great value as we'll see. So I want you to take note that in the ears of God when we speak, whether it be the languages of men or the languages even of angels, in the ears of God, it is the motivation of our hearts that always takes precedence. You may speak something that uh, people think, or that was really great, or that was really extraordinary. But was it said out of a place of love? It goes on, and though I have the gift of prophecy, 
and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Even if somebody has such over-the-top I would call these extraordinary gifts. If they don't have love, Paul the Apostle says they might as well agree that they are nothing. This is telling us something very clearly. Here's what it is. Church family, be very careful what we might be impressed by. Be very careful what we might be desirous of having in our lives. If my motivation is not love, then I am nothing. When placed on the heavenly scales, if the underlying motive for speaking forth God's word, if the underlying motive for understanding the mysteries of God, if the, in the exercise of my faith, I'm really doing it to show off or for self-gratification, to look good for others, to be well thought of. But if it's not of love, then I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods, if I give everything away to the feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, this is really extravagant giving. And though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. This verse is even clearer than the verse before, saying all or any of these things without love has no worth, has no value. There is no profit in it. And the word profit speaks of reward. So in heaven... Without love, there are no rewards. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others. For you will lose your reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth. They have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private and your Father who sees everything will reward you. Some years back, um, well, do you remember when you were kids, did you ever, anybody here ever play Ding Dong Ditch? <laughs> okay, we want to pray for you after service, but uh, that's where you, when we were kids, we would do this. You run up to somebody's house, you ring their doorbell, ding, 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 and then you run away and hide and watch, you know. Well, some years back, I had the bright idea we can do that kind of thing if we know somebody's in need. Go buy that bag of groceries. Go buy that thing that somebody needs and then run up to their house, drop it on the porch, ding, 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 and run away. <laughs> so that the only person that knows is the Lord, the thing that you've done. Wouldn't that be great? Some years back, we had somebody that was giving away $20 bills. <laughs> Nobody ever found out who it was, but if somebody had a need, chances are there'd be a $20 bill slipped into their purse or left on their car windshield. <laughs> it's kind of a fun thing. It, it kind of goes right along with this teaching. So the first three verses make it abundantly clear that you can recognize a follower of Jesus by their love by their selfless giving of which Jesus himself is our example. You ever meet some, you got, any of you got Christian radar? What I mean by that is you can spot another Christian. Yeah, 
Like maybe you're at a uh, restaurant and the person serving, you just go, I, I, I bet that waiter is a believer. Or maybe at school. Or maybe you just meet somebody randomly along the way and you go, I just have a sense that that's another believer. And as you push it to ask to find out, you find out they are a believer. I remember uh, not too long ago, I was at, uh, at Woody's restaurant. Well, this is a little while back. And I, I thought that the waitress might be a Christian, but kind of like hiding it a little bit. So uh, when she came to service, as she walked away, I said, hey, what's your favorite worship song? <laughs> and right away, she shared what her favorite worship song was. It's just a fun thing. There's just that recognition, that love that comes off of somebody who is a believer. So the first three verses are talking about Jesus as our example. Jesus is the perfect picture of love. You see all that he did in leaving heaven, in coming to earth, in leading a sinless life, in taking your sins and mine upon himself, the penalty for our sins, taking it to the cross, dying there, raising from the dead and promising to come back. That's all an act of love. Selfless giving. That's real love. It is not taking, it is giving. I remember my dad used to say, Paul, that's how he talked. Paul, there are two kinds of people in the world. Sometimes he would just shake his head like this. <laughs> kind of like, I know Paul's not going to get this, but I'm going to share it with him anyway. I don't know. He would say there's two kinds of people in the world. There are takers and there are givers. Make sure that you are a giver. That's that, that's that thought of giving selflessly. Now in verses 4 through 7, we find our thoughts and our actions are to be guided by and governed by love. Everything we do is to be governed by love. These verses tell us how love operates, how it shows itself. So let's see how love shows itself. Verse 4 says, love suffers long and is kind. See, I thought about that and I thought, well, you know, I, I, I can kind of suffer long. I can put up with some stuff. But at the end of it, I'm not very kind. <laughs> Do you know how long I waited? <laughs> how about you? Oh, none of you? Okay. <laughs> love suffers long and is kind in the end. Love does not envy. That, that means like being happy when somebody else is blessed and not wanting, but why didn't I get that? It's like being happy for somebody else. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Again, um, I like the translations that use the word arrogant. Love is not arrogant. Watch out for that. You could spot it. You don't want to be near it or with it. This is really great for uh, some of you younger ones. You know, it won't be too long before you're married, you know. And you want to be able to spot love in somebody else. And you want them to be able to spot love in you. And so this becomes so very valuable for probably, probably one of the greatest decisions you'll ever make in your life, which is who to marry. Do they really know how to love? Or is their love all about fun and all about taking? Is their love all about what you can do for me and not a giving, sacrificial kind of love? And do they love Jesus more than they love you? And if that's not the case, you just slam on the brakes as fast as you can. Amen? So what uh, Paul is getting at here in verse 4, he's getting at a way of living. These aren't just platitudes. They are actually giving us a way of living. A way that we are to follow after. Love as a way of life. Watch how seamlessly Jesus fits into these verses. I'm talking Jesus our Lord, Jesus the good shepherd, the one who we are to follow after and imitate. Look at verse four again. Jesus, 
suffers long and is kind. Jesus does not envy. Jesus does not parade himself. He is not arrogant. You can take this whole chapter, remove the word love, and put in the word Jesus. It fits seamlessly. Jesus is our way of life. Love is our way of life. As I follow Jesus, I will be following after a way of living that promotes love. You know, you can do something else with this chapter as well. You can take out the word love and you can put your name in there and see how much it uh, doesn't fit. <laughs> because I've done that. And it doesn't quite fit, not like Jesus, but it tells us all the more I need to be following and keep my eyes and my attention upon Jesus. So when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, this is the way to live by love, is to truly follow in his footsteps. Verse 5 says, love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, and thinks no evil. Again, we are seeing a description of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the revealer of love. The word of God tells us that God is love. Jesus is the goodness that has drawn us to himself. Did you know that it's the goodness of God that causes us to repent? You're just moving along in your life at 100 miles an hour, doing what, it, what you think will please you. And all of a sudden, you come across the love of Jesus. And there's something that is so very attractive about Jesus that it makes you hang a quick U-turn. That's repentance. I want to follow him. I want to live the way he lives. I want to do the things he does from the heart of what he does those things from. We like praying the prayer or at least repeating the prayer of John the Baptist who said, I must decrease, right? And he must increase. Well, that would mean that I must decrease in being who I am as a fallen human being and I must increase in the area of love. Verse, seven tells, verse six tells us, Love does not rejoice in iniquity, I guess not, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love puts up with a whole lot, doesn't it? And the reason why I know that is because God puts up with a whole lot from me. And I'll bet you God puts up with a whole lot from you. That's the love that God is speaking of here. It tells me, you know, okay, not only, you know, is this beautiful, just in the writing, it's gorgeous, but it's also very convicting because it fills me in in this manner that the love that I am so drawn to is very often the love that I fail to live up to. Augustine wrote, a Christian is a mind through which Christ thinks, a heart through which Christ loves, a voice through which Christ speaks, and a hand through which Christ helps. If in reading this chapter, you find within yourself things that would tell you that you are contrary to what is being given to us, let me give you a suggestion. And, and I believe that there's much of the way that we live that is very contrary to 1 Corinthians 13. But you know how when you go to a car dealership and you're thinking of buying a car, uh, what's one of the things you say? Can I take this thing on a, a test drive? I want to try this out and, and see how it feels. Well, in the area of love in particular, uh, the fantastic, amazing way in which it is given to us in this chapter, I want to make a suggestion to you. That in your prayer time, you say, well, Lord, I don't know that I've always, 
operated in this, fa in this fashion. In fact, Lord, I've operated quite the opposite. But Lord, I'm going to try this on. I, I want to try your kind of love on, selfless, self-sacrificing love. I want to take it for a test drive. And then you just do it. You just put on that love. In fact, there's another scripture that tells us put on love. And love covers a multitude of sins because it's self-sacrificing. Just try it on. I'm going to try this on, Lord. And it could be things very practical, like um, I'm going to make uh, the best sandwich I've ever made, and I'm going to give it to somebody else to eat it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to give up my favorite chair. Men, I'm going to wash the dishes. <laughs> Whatever it may be. Just something that you've done that is self-sacrificing, that is not about you. You're not trying to get recognition for it. You're trying to operate in a fashion of love as stated here. How about this one? Have you seen those uh, refueling jets? You know, you can go on YouTube and you can, you can look that up. <laughs> refueling jets. So these big jets, which really are flying gas stations, and they circle, <laughs> and then along comes a jet behind it. Uh, the nozzle goes in, it fills up with uh, jet fuel, it pulls away, and then off goes the jet, and it continues to run. There is a fuel that we're to be running on that we cannot generate. If, if I just think uh, I'm just going to test drive this out of myself, that's not good enough. I need to be fueled with God's love by God, from God, and then to be able to continue on in moving in his love. Are you with me on this? Is it making sense? So then that would require then that I spend some time in God's love. And whether or not you've already tried that, I'm telling you it's the best thing in the world, amen? Where you just say, Lord, I'm gonna be still and I'm gonna know that you're God. And Father, I need to be filled up with your love even right now. And you just plant yourself in God's love because he loves you. He, he, he can't take his eyes off of you. He sees you in a wholeness that you've not experienced yet. You, you think that God can only see you in this one moment. Nuh -uh. God sees you all the way through. He sees you from the time you were formed in your mother's womb and when you were born as a baby and he sees you as a toddler and he sees you growing, six, eight, ten, a teenager. He sees you then as an adult and he sees you going on in your life and then he even sees past that. And God sees you in eternity and he sees you with him and he sees you as a this reflection of his love. He sees all of you all at once and he is determined to love you. And if you'll sit in God's presence, you'll find that he'll put his arms around you. And that satisfaction that you get from God's love and that refueling that you get from God's love is like nothing this world has to offer. And then you can run and you can share what God has given to you. Our daily walk with God is to be our sustenance. He is to be kept ever near, ever dear, and to sit with him often and regularly. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, some of the religious leaders were taking note of Peter and John. Here's what they said. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, at least in their thinking. They marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Where did the boldness come for Peter and John? Where did that boldness to share the love of Jesus Christ with other people, where did that come from? It came from them spending time with Jesus. There's no substitute for that. Beloved, be with Jesus. Be with Jesus. I like to say that Jesus rubs off. 
you will begin to talk like him. You'll begin to see like him. You'll begin to think more like him and you will begin to live more like him. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Beloved, let us love one another and he who does not love does not know God for God is love. In our final verses, we find that love is eternal and gifts, the giftings of the Holy Spirit is not eternal. It's temporary. There is a temporariness to the gifts of God, to the knowledge of God, to prophecies, to speaking in other languages. So what is it that we should be majoring in? Shouldn't our major be in what lasts forever rather than just solely thinking about what the here and now offers? Look at verse eight. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. (laughs) Whether there are tongues, languages, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. And you know what? That's even the very best of us. Even the Apostle Paul in his day, all these things, we just know in part. It's like glimpses. It's like little shots, a little vision here and there of what God is like. Verse 10 says, but when that which is perfect has come, that speaks of Jesus' return, then that which is in part will be done away with. At the return of Jesus Christ, the rest just passes away. It's not needed anymore. Makes me excited about the return of Jesus Christ, (laughs) I'll tell you. But love will never be gone. It's permanent. And like the peace of God, The love of God is the ownership of every believer. Let me tell you this, church. You and love go together. Verse 11 says, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. He's almost like giving us here an illustration of the gifts of the Spirit. We're like children, (laughs) and the Holy Spirit helps us with these gifts, but at some point we'll grow up. That's when Christ returns, and we won't need the childish things anymore. Paul is not saying that if we're spiritually mature, we will not need spiritual gifts. That's not the uh, illustration here. Rather, he assures us that the spiritually mature believer will not overemphasize spiritual gifts and definitely not at the expense of love. Love always comes first. Verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Won't that be remarkable? I, 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 the way that we look at some things now, maybe you'll read a scripture and you go, I don't quite get that. It doesn't make sense to me. And you're always trying to learn and gather information and, and I want that knowledge and Lord, give me wisdom so I can understand these things. It's, it's sometimes like looking through lattice. <laughs> you know, you, you're like, what, what, who's standing there? What is that? Or looking through a dirty window hasn't had any Windex used on it lately. It's dirty and you're kind of like, you know, I kind of see that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. Paul is saying we're in that kind of a position right now where we see dimly, but then when we're face to face with Jesus, once we leave planet Earth and we're face to face with Jesus, 
Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. You know what I think the big expression will be when we get to heaven? I think, I think we'll all stand right around going like this. Oh, now I get it. Oh, absolutely. I, I see it exactly. Thank you for that, Lord. But until then, we walk by faith and not by sight. Verse 13. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. In our closing out of our verses today, certain questions come to my mind as I finish this chapter. They go like this. What is it then that you really, really, really want out of life? What's your bottom line? What do you really want? Is it to love God and to love those that God has placed around you? How about this? What has the greatest value in your life? What is it that you cherish most in your life? Is it a thing? Is it love? Is it God's love? And what is it that you want more of in your life? I hope it's love. Do me a favor. Let's all say verse 13 together. You ready? Here we go. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this chapter, Lord, this love chapter. And I pray, Father, that we would be, we would return to this chapter a number of times. That it would become one of our very favorite chapters of the Bible because we would see it as a challenge. We would see it as an invitation to walk this way, to live this way and to see Jesus in every single verse. Thank you for my brothers and sisters here with us today. Thank you for those who will watch online later. I ask your blessing on each one. And I pray these things in Jesus' magnificent name. And everyone says, let's all stand up then.